We're glad to be spending time together to be discussing just a wee segment of Bermuda's history, a time when the issues of segregation and discrimination were clear and very evident in society. The hospital, however, played a particularly interesting role, but we have to look at it in the context that this was the early 1900s from the, what we know as the Cottage Hospital and moving on to what then became the Bermuda Nursing Home and then the Cottage Hospital Nursing Home and back at King Edward again. So we're going to be going a full circle of what the situation was like for black nurses. The first hospital was the Cottage Hospital that was established in 1894. There were other institutions, but they were not for civilians. There were certainly a couple of military hospitals because of the presence of Britain that was here. The Cottage Hospital was to be the first civilian hospital. It was for merchant seamen because there were a lot of them. It was for visitors and it was for local residents. It was exclusively staffed by white doctors and uh, white nurses. However, black patients were admitted. So black nurses were not allowed to work because of the discriminatory practices. They started a three-year nursing program in 1901. And this was, of course, for white students only. It was funded by donations and by patient fees. And very, very soon after its establishment, it received an annual grant from the government. So in the Cottage Hospital, they did originally have an operating room. That was the most interesting thing. Initially, it was very, very small. It had less than 20 beds by the beginning of the 20th century. The Cottage Hospital was established because there was a need for services that you could only have in a hospital. And it would also reassure tourists who came. But by 1920, it would be replaced by a much larger King Edward Hospital. The matrons, all of them for the early stages, came from Britain. And this set the pattern for what would eventually be the discriminatory practices that we had in Bermuda. But we can't overlook the fact that in Britain itself, they were already training black nurses. So when these white British nurses came out, even prior to the Cottage Hospital, black women were out nursing. They were midwives. And this is what they were well known for. They were often paid in kind, in vegetables, in other food. They were obviously paid money as well, but often they, the, their patients were very poor. They worked very hard. They often traveled by foot because they were working with the patients in their, their homes. Midwives did a lot around a birth. They worked with the patients before the birth. They saw the patient uh, during the pregnancy. And then after the birth, they followed up for several days, weeks even, but days that they actually would be helping the family, even cooking, because the mother was kept in bed for up to 15 days. They would be trained by their mother or another family member or by an acquaintance. They often worked with doctors some were actually had more formal training. They trained at the Royal Naval Hospital in Dockyard. Others were trained by doctors such as Dr. Richard Packwood. For others, in the late 19th century, a few were beginning to go to the United States to train. In the early 20th century, the numbers increased. However, when they came home, their choices were really limited. Possibly they could work at the nursing home, but the positions were very few. So most of the time they had to work as a private duty nurse or as midwife or leave Bermuda, as some did, because there were more possibilities elsewhere. So even if black midwives were extremely well trained, they still could not work at the cottage hospital even if they were better than the people who were at the cottage hospital. It was quite simply, you could not work there if you were black. What was the Bermuda Nursing Home? It was a very small institution. It was founded in about 
1905. It was midwifery in the hospital as well. And the nurses and the students, so there was a student program almost immediately, they also did a lot of district work. That is, they went out to patients' homes. In 1924, Dr. Andrew Balfour, a British specialist in tropical medicine, was invited to Bermuda to make suggestions to improve public health in order to make Bermuda more attractive to tourists. He did a very thorough investigation and he highlighted many problems and made suggestions for improvements. For example, better methods of mosquito control, as that was a big problem then. One aspect he also highlighted was the high infant and maternal mortality rate, especially among black women in Bermuda. Two things did come out of this. One was the regulation of midwives to help improve infant mortality and maternal mortality. And this included requiring a certification exam that the midwives had to pass in order to practice. And this excluded many midwives who had trained on the job instead of getting some formal training. The other was the Bermuda Welfare Society District Nursing Program. Eventually, the Bermuda Nursing Home then occupied the space that was previously used by the Cottage Hospital. First of all, there was a name change. It became the Bermuda Nursing Home Cottage Hospital. And the space that was there was used, of course, by the black nurses who came and they trained there. I shared a room with another girl. We had a big single beds. We got the patients up, we washed them, fed them, cleaned them up. And if there was dirty lin linen, we had to wash it out with new gloves. But we used to work and then we had to go to school. And if someone that passed during the night died at night, we had to get up and assist with the body, clean the body up and all that. This is Millicent Grace Louise de Shield Washington. My mama speaks very fondly about the preemies. Remember your preemie mother? Yeah. <laughs> she, she told me that she wrapped the preemie in cotton wool and fed it with an eyedropper and massaged it with olive oil. So I think the preemies were her favorite and it was funded by voluntary groups, the friendly societies, the churches, other well-meaning um, people. It's standard for nursing students to do an awful lot of what we might call grunt work. All along I felt, is this nursing? This is, this is not like what I felt I was, I expected. Just cleaning and washing dead clothes. You know, I felt there was more. I only left because I felt there was a mole up there and Marion Simons came to Bermuda after graduating in England and she showed us the Times magazine and the nursing times and stuff and you could go over there and you can get job, you know, work and study and we read all the, you know, the magazines and whatever and I said, wow. And she said, you can even go to Europe, it's not far. Da, 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 da. And well, I said, what? So that's what sparked me off. The Lincoln School for Nurses was established to provide nursing education for black women. It started off by a two-year program, then in 1905, it went to a three-year program. It was one of the handful of hospitals that would accept black women as nursing students. This and the fact that it was on the East Coast is why Black Bermudian women tended to go there to study nursing. And that's when many of them came back from the U.S. and they were highly qualified. They were not accepted at King Edward Memorial Hospital. The mere fact that they didn't go to the King Edward was because we were Black. Let's face it. The Bermudian, black Bermudian nurses at that time felt things were very unfair that they were not allowed to work at King Edward. Whether they trained at the Cottage Hospital, a Lincoln Hospital, or England, or 
in Montreal, they were not allowed to work at King Edward because of the color of their skin. There's one nurse who was responsible for overseeing a 300-bed hospital, but she was not good enough to work in Bermuda because of her color. And it is suspected that she was far more qualified than many of the British nurses that came here. In hospitals all over the country, we find West Indian nurses. People like Lorraine Dyer, who came over here for training. Lorraine came from Bermuda in 1937. She now has many diplomas and tells me she is going to open a nursing home when she gets back. white Canadian nurse that lived in St. George's was going to um, the, the first meeting and invited my mom to come along. Um, but all of the, the nurses there at that time were white nurses. And while my mother could go to the Red Cross meetings and do things with them, she was not allowed to work in King Edward at the blood bank when it came and also they had um, educational programs at King Edward, but she was not allowed to attend them, although she was a trained nurse. She said it galled her. Um, she also talked about, you know, catching the train from St. George's up to town and to Warwick and where they had to sit, you know, in the colored section. Of, of the trains and those type of things. Bermuda was quite segregated at that time. It was difficult because a lot of prejudice had to be broken down, but there was nobody there at that time to put it in action, as it were. There's a transitioning period where there are white district nurses. The BWS was a group of white women, many of them suffragettes. In their struggle to win the vote, they felt they needed to prove their worth in society. And so this was one of the motives when in 1926, they set up a program that would, within a few years, put Queen's nurses, now Queen's nurses trained in special program in England. These Queen's nurses would be put into each parish to serve as district nurses, and they would do nursing and midwifery. This qualification, being a Queen's nurse, excluded Black uh, nurses and midwives, those who had formal training trained in the United States. So eventually, this, this system was put into effect, and eventually the district nurses covered about a third of the maternity cases, and they served many other nursing needs in, in patients' homes. That was positive for the population, but it made it harder for Black nurses and midwives to make a living because some of their patients were being taken away. You could not be a Queen's nurse if you trained in the U.S. It was a way, again, of simply, and I'm going to use this word, crushing the possible progress of black nursing in Bermuda. So what happened at that stage is that if these black nurses went off to Lincoln, and some of them went to various places across the U.S., and returned to Bermuda qualified, they were not a queen's nurse, they would become eventually a nurse's aide. And, and that makes a difference in terms of what you can do, and it also makes a difference in terms of, of your salary. Cairo Spencer, who was from Smith's Parish, wanted to work at King Edward, but would likely have been turned down. And what happened to her case, a group of black Bermudian parishioners, they lived in Hamilton Parish, they actually formed the Hamilton Parish Nursing Association and hired her to be the district nurse. There appeared to be no real way for them to get ahead until approximately 1953. That is a pivotal moment in Bermuda's racial history, and since we're talking about nurses, racial history. For the first time in 1953, when there was a general election, out of the 36 members of parliament, a quarter of them were colored. 
And with these nine came a great amount of experience. Out of that nine was a smaller group. The very first session that the house held, Russell Pierman raised an important question. There should be an interracial council that is formed to address primarily and intentionally the discriminatory practices in Bermuda across the whole gamut in government services and this of course included the hospital. Henry Tucker who later became Bermuda's first government leader and we now call them premiers said oh no 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 let's not have a interracial council Let's have an interracial committee. The importance cannot be overlooked. An interracial council would have allowed the governor, in consultation with the members of parliament, to go out into the community and choose people to be on that council. They need not be members of parliament. An interracial committee, they had to be members of parliament. So, the nine members, five were white and four were black. It was agreed that they would have an interracial committee. Now, it was a disappointment to the colored members because they wanted people who were really prominent in society, such as Dr. Can, to be on this group. So, who did they have? Mr. Russell Pierman. They had Mr. Hilton Hill, who was well known for his... Uh, his photography, I believe. They had uh, Mr. Edward Richards, who, was, who had taught at the Barclay Institute and was uh, a barrister at that stage. And they had the fiery Dr. Gordon. And it was the intention of these men that they would hold the feet of the other five white men to the fire and have them be accountable for the racial wrongs that were occurring in Bermuda. And they did as best as they could in that sense. Gordon was critical of the policy of the welfare society that required district nurses to be Queen's nurses. In 1946, Gordon takes his famous petition to the UK, it's the Bermuda Workers Association petition. That petition laid out a list of racial and social injustices and nurses of course got a mention in that as well. And the petition called it absurd that local nurses could not train at KEMH. Their main option was training in Bermuda if they didn't go off to the UK, and only a few were going off to the UK at this point. And so black nurses were training at the Cottage Hospital nursing home. But that was really a nursing home. It wasn't a full-scale hospital. It had a, a, a maternity component, but for example, they didn't do operations there. There was no operating room. KEMH had a nursing school for white nurses only. The key question was, why is it that colored nursing could not work at King Edward Memorial Hospital. And there was every conceivable excuse from the medical superintendent and the governing body of the hospital. Words such as, we need to be cautious. We don't want to throw what we've accomplished out. What were they saying by statements like that? They were clearly saying that the black nurses or the colored nurses at that stage were not up to academic capabilities or practical nursing as the nurses that had come back from Britain. And that was so wrong. It was inaccurate, it was proved to be inaccurate. Mr. Pierman says, the hospital continued in refusing to accept colored girls to work as nurses, no matter how high their qualifications. They were not even allowed to train as nurses in the hospital. Many excellent colored girls were obliged to work outside of Bermuda. Mr. Richards raised the issue. If the government's money were spent to enlarge the King Edward VII Memorial Hospital to provide training for nurses both white and black, and that's his argument there, 
to bring about the acceptance of colored doctors and nurses on an equal footing, then truly the government of the day would be doing its work. Mr. James Pearman, on the other side of the racial fence, is white, gives us a quick snapshot of the fears, and that's really what it is. It's the white fear that is driving this. The hospital authority should be given an opportunity to explain to the committee some of the difficulties they would foresee in a major altercation of the policy of this kind. The problem had to be approached from a practical point of view. What is practical? What is a practical point of view in that sense? Mr. Watlington, a white member, it was essential not to destroy what had already been achieved. Dr. Gordon, the whole medical setup in Bermuda was absolutely rotten. Mr. Hill, what could be destroyed by employing competent people regardless of their racial origin? The chairman, Mr. Tucker, it had to be recognized that at the present time, the administration of health matters was in white hands. And therein lay your response to that. And it was essentially, with a statement like that, it was going to be determined that white hands would determine what the final outcome would be. Racism is contradictory and it's confusing. Here we have a situation where black qualified nurses came back from the U.S. primarily. White doctors would contact them and place them in the homes of wealthy Bermudians, wealthy white Bermudians. But again, they were not allowed to work in the hospital. Now, the 1953 Interracial Committee came up with some suggestions. And one of the great things about that was that colored nurses were allowed to train eventually in KEMH. Barbara Gordon, who was one of Dr. Gordon's daughters, she trained as a nurse and she then served in the women's section of the Air Force during the Second World War. And then Marjorie, his youngest daughter, she trained in a hospital in the UK in Surrey and that hospital was heavily bombed during the war. Another Bermudian nurse who was working during the war years was Lorraine dyer Bizek. She worked in an area in the UK that was heavily bombed during the war. So she ended up taking care of the war wounded as well. So she was at the center of things. So here we have in Bermuda, King Edward closing down a war because they cannot get enough nurses. Here we have Gordon's daughters trained in hospital having served in the war and they really can't work at King Edward. And in fact, when you think about it, it even we go back to Gordon in 1955 on his deathbed, the hospital, they have to give his daughter special dispensation to actually be allowed to enter the hospital to nurse him. So the 1950s was a pivotal time. People were just starting to really move in the sense of blacks were becoming more vocal uh, after the interracial committee. And we see lots of changes in the 50s. I believe one of them is the theater of Waikai. I was happy when I heard right after the end of the war that um, the doors were opening for anyone who wanted to do nursing. Wow. After the interracial committee made its document and report uh, public, and it was supported by the House, there was one black young woman who stood outside of King Edward VII Memorial Hospital. And she determined and purposed in her heart that she would work there. That nurse was Barbara Wade, commonly known as Barbara Lovey Wade. She went off to uh, Britain. She trained there. She tells of her experiences and the friendships that she made. Not one did she mention that she was the subject of racial discrimination. What did come up was her great disappointment 
when she returned to Bermuda. You see, she trained as an OR nurse and also pediatrics. So for those two areas for her, it was really important. This is where she wanted to be. She came back and told her and they were informed that there were no jobs. Barbara and her mother went down and had a talk, a long talk with the matron. And the matron then said to her, she was not qualified enough. Put in this perspective, she was already more qualified than white British nurses. And in fact, a girlfriend and colleague of hers returned to Bermuda with her. Same qualifications. She got the job, but Barbara didn't. It's not, it's not difficult to see what, what was going on there. So after it was informed that Barbara was informed that she had to take a midwife course, and her argument was, but that's not really the area I want to be in. She realized she couldn't get the job unless she went off. Irony of ironies. There was a white Bermuda nurse who had also come back when she was applying. The authorities at the hospital realized there is no way that they could let her work with the same qualifications as Barbara. So she too had to go off to Montreal. She went off to Montreal General. Upon return, there was no way that the hospital administration could say that she was not qualified. Barbara Lovey Wade managed to come at a time as the first ward nurse, meaning that she had access to the whole ward and patients there. Now, I also want to mention that it didn't mean that there were not black nurses in the hospital at that stage, but she was assigned one patient. She was not a ward nurse. She was assigned one patient and only that patient. She was allowed to apparently take lunch, but she couldn't eat with the other white nurses. Well, the white nurses, they could get all of their time off, you know, for eating. They could go to the, um, to, to the dining room. That was the place to go. But I was not even told about that. I was not invited or told anything. So I brought my lunch and I would eat it in a side room by myself. So the Herm sister, she was English and we were kind of friendly and I asked her, do you have any lockers? Where are your lockers? And she sort of blushed and on the premises of the hospital, they had lockers, proper lockers. I didn't know that until later on. But we had to go, rain, blow, shine, we went up there and changed. Domestics, whatever, as long as you were black. And you know those racks you hang clothes on? That's what they had in the middle of the room. You know, I think very disrespectful. If you were a white nurse, as most of them were, they had the freedom to, to go with a doctor to view a patient who was going to have an operation, or if they had to get eyes tested or something like that, they could freely move. I could not freely move, and nobody who was my color or any other color, color other than white, they were not accepted as a nurse. And so therefore, if they were not accepted as a nurse, you're in the background all the time. And they gave me one patient in particular to look after instead of a ward, and I did that. The doctor who always came in was that I met was the same doctor uh, who had that patient. That was the, and that's the reason why he came, to see her. He never, I had to be at, the, um, at her bed, at her bedside when he came because that was what was expected of me. I was her nurse. But he came and he came, he didn't speak to me. He didn't even look at me, even though I had to be there. It was utter rejection of a colored person. 
So uh, to tell you the truth, um, I began to, it began to affect my nervous system because I had not met with that type of behavior in England. I come to my own country and I meet with it. And I said, you know, this is just not right. It's affecting me um, in a way that I have never been affected before in my life. I don't think I can stand or withstand this type of behavior. And so I decided to leave nursing. KEMH, over its history, has always had a shortage of nurses. And uh, this continued. Uh, part of that shortage initially was that they wouldn't accept black nurses. When they were not getting white nurses, they really felt they had to do something. And that meant that they had to undo the racist structure that they had established. So we cannot have a discussion about Bermuda history and nursing in Bermuda uh, relating to black nurses without mentioning Sylvia Richardson. Miss Richardson was trained at the Cottage Hospital Nursing Home and she worked really hard while she was there, the medical superintendent noticed that she was so committed to her work that he encouraged her to work at the health department. When Sylvia Richardson got that position, the door was suddenly opened a lot more than a crack for the opportunities for other young colored slash later black nurses that would come. Those nurses who were the pioneers, they were incredible. They were obviously people of determination. I think the nurses all along were people of, of great ability, but the ones who actually made the breakthrough, some of it was the right time, but I think it was also their determination that uh, they weren't going to accept second best treatment. Racism just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Despite all of the obstacles that were put in the way of these black nurses. They were determined that they would serve not just blacks, but the whole Bermuda community. And until we come together and determine that it is not about black and it is not about white, yet still valuing our past history, but building on it and being very careful not to repeat it. Breaking down racial barriers, uh, that had to do with, with the fact that I, as a person of color, went to work at King Edward. That in itself was a breaking of a barrier. Because after all, they did accept me. I think I get, I get angry sometimes looking back. I get angry and I, 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 I really think I'm glad I found the Lord because I would have been a different person. Clearly if you go to KEMH now, they have a diverse staff, very Bermudian and, and color is not an issue. And we would have seen that when the first black nursing director, Lucille Parker Swan, and from that time, the doors have been opened in many regards. The world has opened up so many different opportunities in different areas, in different fields for anybody, black, white, red, whatever color they are. It's not the color of your skin, it's the content of your character. The younger generation, those who are younger, much younger than I am, they are bolder. If they are willing, in a way, in a, in a way it's made for them, you know, if they have enough money, uh, they can go places.